And so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of today. Uh, Jesse Wheeler is a biologist at Acadia National Park in Bar Harbor, Maine. And he's gonna talk to us about community-based management to preserve natural communities at Acadia National Park. So Jesse, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, you can go ahead and share yours. All right, thanks, Carrie. Do this here. All right, can you guys see the slide up there? Yep, looks great, okay. Jesse. <laughs> Anyhow, so thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Jesse Wheeler, and so part of my role as a vegetation program manager at Acadia National Park uh, really has to do with invasive species and also how we're going to manage our natural and cultural resources into uncertain future with climate change and, and a lot of other uh, challenges moving forward. Uh, I'd like to start by by saying that Acadia really is in uh, have does have healthy uh, intact systems, particularly forests and wetlands. Uh, we're located on the the coast of Maine. Uh, we've been around as as a park for over a hundred years, and we're really one of the healthiest in terms of again some of these forest uh, and wetland metrics uh, in the un eastern United States. We have a nice diverse, um, multi, you know, multi aged. Uh, Forest. We have young forests. We have mature forests. Uh, we have some nice intact what, what freshwater wetlands, uh, salt marshes, and shoreline. Uh, so that combined with not a large presence of invasive plants and other invasive species, uh, we, we are coming from a place now of mostly intact systems, relatively healthy. Uh, our goal as a national park unit really is to preserve, protect our natural and cultural uh, communities and, uh, and uh, resources. And part of what I want to talk to you about today is really, again, like this community in the sense of the natural communities and, and how they interact, but also um, in the, the people, the human dimension as well, and working together to protect these resources. So while we protect these resources, it's not really just like a, a, a steady state to, you know, thing in time, it's really that there's continuous change. And so we recognize that we want to support that there's change uh, that's in a healthy and desirable direction and hopefully allows for adaptation for systems to kind of change along, along with that. Uh, of course, we do have forest uh, pet invasive insect pests and uh, invasive plants uh, in, in the park and in the region. And we're starting to see that they are taking advantage of warmer temperatures with climate change, uh, as well as a disruption in historic patterns of moisture availability. So we're seeing more intense storms, uh, larger events with, with water, more intense periods of drought as well. So these are all right stressors that are that are adding to to uh, challenge challenges that we face in maintaining these these intact systems. Uh, we have had disturbance on the landscape for millennia since the, the, the glacier, right, which was the part of disturbance, but, you know, a healthy disturbances are usually a bit in the smaller scale range. They could be infrequent, but small forest fires. Uh, we have had a big one here um, in, the, in the past. They usually will look at like uh, beaver uh, dams, floods, uh, wind throw, so wind storms, uh, things like that, as well as native forest pests. Uh, like like spruce budworm that can you know have ups and downs and reach kind of epidemic scales, but basically if we have most of these natural disturbance regimes that add to increasing our diversity, uh, structural diversity, species diversity within our landscapes, it's the uncertainty about where climate change and a lot of these invasive pests are going to interact that might create larger scale uh, disturbances in many compounding on the on the on each other uh, so as far as what non-native force pests are concerned we've had we've been dealing with some of them for a while now but they're really starting to uh, multiply uh, and what we're really seeing are the ones that are taking advantage of lower excuse me higher winter minimum temperatures uh, so warmer winters uh, in particular that allow for more pests to survive year to year uh, future climate conditions look pretty pretty good 
for that to continue uh, and, and for more to kind of come in and, and continue to survive and spread. Uh, and, and people continue to move past. Uh, this goes for plants and in, insects. Uh, largely, it's unintentional, right? Might be moving plant material, soils, uh, firewood, things like that. Uh, but that is that is happening, and that's a component of it as well as people move move across the landscape. Uh, I'm going to give you a kind of a little bit of an ex example, kind of a, a, a case study of, a, of an invasive insect pest that did come a little bit under our radar and kind of blindsided us. This is the red pine scale uh, that was native to Japan and, and Eastern Asia that was uh, detected uh, at, in, in the park uh, and on the Mount Desert Island region of the park in 2014. Uh, we had been seeing red pines declining in the park for a few years prior to that. Pathologists basically thought that it was uh, some fungal pathogens and poor site conditions that were contributing to their decline. Uh, however, in late 2014, we had Maine Forest Service entomologists uh, detect the the scale insect on 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 these trees, and so basically what that what that meant was we we, we didn't know anything about the insects, so we had to learn uh, what what that pest could do uh, from el where it was elsewhere in the Northeast. Uh, we also had to, to define where where are red pine trees, where how you know far has the pest spread across the landscape. Um, and so what we did is we worked with partners with, with uh, state agencies, U.S. Forest Service, also the local land trust, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, to set up some monitoring plots to try to find where our red pine uh, trees were, and, as well as the, the, the pest across the landscape and onto the island uh, region of the park. And unfortunately, what we basically found with doing some branch samples is that the pest had moved already basically across the whole landscape and was uh, affecting trees that that looked asymptomatic, they looked healthy, but the pest was there. Uh, right away, we started to communicate with adjacent landowners about what was going on, why are they seeing all these red pines, what could be done about it, what maybe couldn't be, but what we might be able to expect. Um, so we set up these monitoring plots. We were trying to assess the decline of the red pine, the advancement of the scale insect, as well as what was going to be happening with the, the forest as it changed. Some of the images you can see here, uh, on Norvega Mountain, uh, essentially in 2014, when it first came in some reddish grayish, grayish bands of forest canopy that were dying. Five years later in the same area, kind of gray and already dead there. Uh, so unfortunately, it only took a handful of years and most of our red pines uh, are, are now dead. And so five to six years after we set up those initial monitoring plots, we tried to resample again with the help from uh, local college students at the College of the Atlantic. And preliminary results really are showing that the forest uh, understory is, is largely made up of native seedlings, tree seedlings. Uh, so, that, so that's a good, a good sign of what could be, become the, the, the future forest. Um, and this is kind of a mix of white pine, uh, pitch pine in some sites, spruce, hardwood. Uh, the images that you can see here from the, when red pines were alive and part of the canopy, this is from the Kittred Brook Preserve Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Uh, it's kind of hard to see with a little bit of the snow cover, but there weren't too many seedlings there. Just a couple of weeks ago in 2022, the exact same area is really covered by, again, mostly these, these white pine seedlings. So that's a good sign. We haven't seen in these areas uh, invasive plants coming in, but that's something that we're concerned about. Uh, and I uh, would say that, you know, in, we're concerned with invasive plants coming to these areas, but red pine is really a minor component of our Acadia's forests. It's probably around 1% or less than, and occurs in small pockets of stands, and then mostly just kind of mixed in with a lot of other stuff. And so we're not, it may look like a large scale kind of disturbance when you see a lot of them dying, but we're not necessarily seeing them falling over just yet. And we're not seeing that other kinds of disturbance or other plants that otherwise weren't there and now taking advantage of some light. Um, so too, kind of too late to save a lot of the red pines, but we can document the change and influence how we might respond to other pests moving forward. Uh, so we are monitoring for other emerging pests. Uh, those can be some of the, the big profile ones like emerald ash borer, um, spruce, uh, or sorry, yeah, spruce on horn beetle, maybe uh, southern pine beetle, things like that, that we're collaborating with the state agencies, uh, as well as APHIS and university researchers 
uh, for that. And we will kind of see, we're kind of waiting, you know, to see when things come in there. Uh, one example with the hemlock woolly adelgid, which we've learned a little bit about in previous uh, symposia presentations, uh, that has been expanding in the coast of Maine and was just found right outside of the park uh, in a forested setting uh, last May or in 2020, actually. Um, and so we haven't detected it in the park yet, but basically when that kind of came on, we were like, okay, we need to take a proactive approach. We need to kind of gather our team, kind of figure out who we need, what we need to do to be able to respond in a more hopefully um, effective way than what we did with red pine. And so we're working with our partners at Scudic Institute, um, it's a research learning center here at, at the park, and scientists there lead remote sensing so we can identify individual or pockets of hemlock. We can try to prioritize hemlock stands, um, as well as uh, ash, tree species, and other species vulnerable to pests coming in. That'll be in, in Acadia, as well as Catan Woods National Monument, uh, a little bit uh, north of us, Catan Woods and Waters. We're working with the University of Maine researchers for long-term scenario planning, uh, working closely with U.S. Forest Service, Maine Forest Service, and, and other Park Service folks to produce good response plans, uh, and that we can slow the spread. We can have monitoring protocols and kind of figure out what we're going to do in certain certain situations. Um, we also have to communicate and work with our adjacent landowners because the system kind of goes across bound, boundaries, certainly. So again, this this uh, kind of equation here of invasive insects uh, and invasive plants uh, really contribute to again that challenging system when you think of increased disturbances, especially as we add in the climate change and future projections of the warming that we've mentioned. This would likely increase insect outbreaks, uh, invasive plant growth, uh, depleted you know plant communities uh, where we have drought killed plants, perhaps we have floods that have done some physical disturbance, um, all these kinds of things that are that are going to be continuing to increase with climate change. And then of course, if we once we have invasive plant thickets, or if that's something that we have, especially on an understory, that's going to prevent future forest regeneration. So invasive plant management is another key kind of pillar to us trying to allow for forests and wetlands to be resilient here and have, a, have kind of a fighting chance. Uh, one quick example from another park, for, uh, Morristown National Historic Park, New Jersey, where they've been not as lucky. They have a lot of, a lot of invasive plant cover. You can see this image of Japanese barberry. Um, they also have a lot of lack of tree re regeneration. A lot of deer contribute to that, but certainly with the invasive plant cover. And when Superstorm Sandy and other canopy gap, gaps were created years ago, uh, it just in, it made for a kind of a worse and worse situation. And so that's something we want to try to avoid. So again, we prioritize um, re removing invasive plants where we can under forest cover uh, so that it doesn't, it doesn't kind of have a whole understory landscape and it allows the native species and native tree seedlings to thrive. One quick example, same species that Japanese barberry, there's at Morristown that we do have in Acadia. Um, just an image of a few handful of sites we managed a handful of years. So it is spread across our landscape, just not in the same densities, uh, like down in New Jersey. Um, and some of these areas are like on the side of a mountain that otherwise is relatively unimpacted. Uh, and we wouldn't expect to find a lot of invasive plants, but sometimes they crop up here. And so in 2019, we responded, we removed that after a few years. Invasive plant uh, cover has been much reduced. So hopefully that sets us up for uh, for success, even though there's a lot of ash in that canopy, for example, um, uh, when when we have future disturbances from invasive plants and other uh, climate change and influence disturbances. Uh, we also have it kind of in, internal partners or help from the National Park Service Inventory Monitoring Division, which is great. We have long-term forest and wetland vegetation plots and monitoring going on. Uh, this image here where, where there's a lot of kind of uh, dots that are hard to see along the, in the park on this MDI portion as well as Ilaho and, and Scudic portion of the park that don't have invasive plants and then these dark uh, little triangles and circles there are invasive plants detected so they kind of help us in that getting that pulse of the system. Um, we also need to we also have invasive plant management teams in a regional scale that can go be kind of like a strike team or have emergency response at parks 
in the Northeast here. Uh, we, they can also support funding and support for long-term management of these plants um, and sites. We're also, we also have been working with neighbors, so these might be large land owners adjacent, like the Jackson Laboratory over here, which had a glossy buckthorn uh, invasion, uh, still does. Uh, and so that's right up you know, near our boundary, so we're trying to work with them. And then we have Land and Garden Preserve as well that has issues nearby that we're working with them to reduce this overall. Hi, and Jesse. So just yep. wanted to, um, we're at the end. Oh, perfect. Okay. That, that, yeah, that's it. I just, yeah, thanks, Gary. But anyhow, we're just trying to make sure that we have, we have a future. We're in a good place and we're kind of we're working with others to try to make sure that we continue to have forests. <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was such a great uh, presentation. It's so interesting to see all the work you guys are doing up in Acadia. Um, and so please, everyone, feel free. I'm, um, Jesse won't be answering questions till the panel discussion. Um, and so right now we are going to move to our next speaker, uh, Laura Matei, who is the Director of Stewardship at the Sudbury Valley Trustees in Massachusetts. And she's gonna present on complicated decision-making for invasive control. So with that, please uh, take the screen, Laura, and share your presentation. Thanks, Carrie. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be with you here today. Um, Sudbury Valley Trustees is a regional land trust located in Metro West Boston, and we work in 36 communities. So I'm here representing the scale of a small land trust where we can get pretty down and dirty with our neighbors and our volunteers. Um, I'm highlighting our Smith Conservation Land in Littleton. This was a partnership project with the Littleton Conservation Trust and the town of Harvard. One piece of the, of the conservation land is actually owned by Harvard and, it, and is in the budding town of Harvard. So some of the key points I'd like you to think about as I go through my presentation are the, that changing climate and rising CO2 levels, as most of us know are likely to exacerbate invasive plant population. And some initial studies are uh, demonstrating that perhaps the use of herbicides will become less effective because of, of a couple of reasons. One might be the biology where you have um, a greater root mass developing with uh, uh, higher CO2 levels. And so therefore, when you do a foliar application, it's kind of diluting that application because there's so much root mass. Um, and there were a couple of studies there uh, that RISI has on their website that talk a little bit more about that. So that's something to watch for. Um, also, the need to be careful of over-reliance on herbicides. It's, it is a tool in our toolbox. Um, but it's important to continually test new methods and really keep track of what we're doing and share those results. Certainly in Massachusetts, we found that a lot of us aren't doing a, a, a good enough job of record keeping and then sharing those results. So we're trying to improve that across the board. Um, and then there's always contextual factors that we're dealing with. What are the important biodiversity factors at a particular property? And what are the public relations issues that go along with that? So this property, Sudbury Valley Trustees owns uh, the red outline areas. It's uh, along Whitcomb Avenue in Littleton, and this is the Harvard parcel here. And it's really a mix, a beautiful mix of habitat types. There's um, some nice marshes here along the Beaver Brook. And then to the west, there's a, a ravine, a really gorgeous ravine and a black pond, uh, some deep hemlock forests. But there's a lot of disturbed areas that were neglected for a number of years. Um, they had completed a forest, uh, management plan, the Smith family is who we acquired it from. And um, so we did have some initial information about what was happening on the property and some of the habitat areas. Um, this entire uh, parcel and conservation land is located within the uh, Biomap 2 corridor for important forest and wetlands corridors. So it straddles three towns. And it additionally has a rare turtle there. So there's, and also some several um, high quality vernal pools. So these are the factors that we want to enhance in our management. 
So as I said, there were years, unfortunately, of neglect, and this property became heavily invaded over the last 25 years, particularly with Asian Bittersweet, but also with a number of Forbes that carpet several acres, including garlic mustard and uh, narrow leaf bittercress. So there was a lot of nasty damage. You were getting into some trouble here. Um, so half of the property, so 22 acres of the 54 acres is, is in bad shape. And what we want to do is start to rebuild the ecosystem functions, the native biodiversity and, and the resilience, because as we know, it can only get worse and we wanna slowly build that up. It was um, part of what exacerbated this problem was that there are several non-native tree plantations so there's a red pine plantation that you see on your left. We know that red pine don't do well up here and, and they're succumbing to bittersweet and all dying. So it's, it's a nasty situation there. And then on the right, there's a stand of European tamarack. Um, those trees actually are doing well, but unfortunately they are heavy in, heavily invaded with the bittersweet. So they're not gonna do well for long. And in both of those cases, we have monocultures. That's not good for resilience in the, in the face of climate change. So our goals here were to reduce the abundance, especially of the Asian bittersweet. We wanna increase the abundance of our native plants, generally increase uh, native insects, native plants, improve the food abundance for breeding birds because when we do our breeding bird survey, we're finding that the birds aren't using that bad habitat. We find them in the nice wetlands to either side, but not in that, that very degraded area. So we really need to strengthen the forest health. Uh, again, you know, looking at those factors of climate change. And as, as I think most of you know, a lot of good management practices are the same with when you're looking at the lens of climate change, but some of them become a little bit more urgent and you have uh, kind of another lens to kind of think about how you're conducting your management on a specific site. So we consulted with many experts uh, from Mass Wildlife, from the Heritage Program, from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service and some other ecologists. And, and they did recommend, given the extent of the invasion and the heavy invasion, they, they recommended a standard herbicide approach of cut and dab with some foliar treatments. Now in our case, uh, when we went to propose this to the commission, uh, the commission was initially generally supportive. However, we had some neighbors who were very concerned and started putting up some really strong opposition. So we paused. Um, and we really looked at, into researching alternatives over a whole year. Um, and we were also alerted to some different sensitive receptors such as residential wells, being part of a zone two water supply protection and a daycare center. So this is a complicated site um, and there was a lot going on there. Um, in our research on alternative techniques, uh, certainly repeated manual removal in small areas can be successful, but in larger areas, it's more challenging. We have looked at using and have started using full root extraction of oriental bittersweet. And it is, as you might imagine, quite time intensive. Um, however, I actually feel like it has um, some merit because over time, it is effective because you really are removing so much of the plant. Uh, four savers in Vermont tried uprooting and shredding with a special machine. That didn't go so well because they had a follow up with herbicides. Uh, flaming is not effective on bittersweet uh, just because of its intricate root system. Goats can be a good initial clearing for more open areas, but generally not a good long-term solution, especially for a forested area. Um, some cases are using it um, to help with meadow management. Um, some people who don't want to use herbicides have recommended repeated cutting and otherwise known as carbon starvation, which I have found doesn't work because cutting bittersweet makes it really happy. So I really don't think that's gonna be a good long-term solution. Um, and then there's solarization, which has often been done with plastic. So that brings in a whole other factor 
Again, it's probably only gonna work in open land situations, not in forests. Um, we're actually gonna try to use cardboard in one of our more open areas to see how well we can get that to work uh, and to replace some native plants. Uh, we did look at organic herbicides. Um, they're only topical killing and damaging leaves. They need to be repeated a lot and they're very expensive. And we also don't know the environmental impacts really at this time. We did a full literature review um, of glyphosate and triclopyr. And um, well, there's, there's a lot of qualifications. I mean, our conclusion is that given the very um, small amounts and very controlled manner that we use these chemicals in invasive plant management, that we do conclude that it is a very low risk to human and the human health and the environment. Um, so as we move forward with this process, we did gain a uh, better acceptance by some of the neighbors, not others. We did um, start to get some, um, I should say that while the Conservation Commission initially opposed the, pro um, I'm sorry, initially supported the project, then we had all the opposition from neighbors and then they were concerned, but then they started swinging back as we added more information. Um, so we initially modified our proposal and here you can see, let's see if I can point out the round circles are the residential zones. Then the uh, wetlands are delineated to the east and to the west with the different buffer zones. Uh, we allowed for no chemical use around the residential areas where we had uh, people who were particularly concerned. So we, it, as again, it's a complicated site. We divided it into different management areas um, and would be doing some handwork in some areas and then using herbicides in others and phasing it in. So in 2021, we did start training volunteers in root excavation of the bittersweet that you can see in the lower photos and also in pulling some of the invasive uh, herbaceous plants such as garlic mustard and the narrow leaf bitter cress. And, um, uh, and again, those take time. So we are really limiting the area that we're doing that in and using that more in the sensitive areas and wetland buffers. And this is a close up of our red pine plantation we're experimenting with root excavation in one plot of the 100 foot wetland buffer and the repeated cutting carbon starvation in the other plot here. We're gonna keep those moving, moving forward so we can demonstrate over time how well that does or doesn't do. And that red pine plantation, as I said earlier, is not uh, a good thing in terms of resilience with or without climate change, but with climate change, it's even worse. Um, and we'll be looking at, there is some um, sugar maple in there, some oaks and hickory. So we'll be looking at what comes back as we move forward and see if we also need to do some planting in there as well. So there are challenges with mechanical control. The root extraction is very time consuming. And if you have poison ivy and deer ticks, as we do here, you also run into safety hazards for staff or volunteers. It can be challenging to maintain morale. So, you know, we really had to do a mix of approaches at this site. Um, we did do a site-specific risk assessment on the herbicides and uh, by a professional a risk assessor and, and it was concluded again that it was very low risk. And with some additional site visits with the Conservation Commission and um, also with some of the stakeholders, we were able to persuade the commission and others that in fact, our initial approach was a good one. So we were able to increase our careful use of herbicides, um, but still keep some of those mechanical approaches. So the takeaways from a practitioner point of view is to, is to fully explore non-chemical alternatives. And again, as practitioners, we have to keep 
keeping good records and sharing those results with each other, um, evaluating if there's any sensitive receptors, um, really have a look at doing your community outreach, um, staying up to date on information, which I think it's nice that we can do that with both the, the RISI as well as with MyPAG, the Massachusetts uh, Environmental Plant Advisory Group. And there are some other groups like the one I'm a part of, the Soasco Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. Um, so these are ways that um, we can learn from each other, which I think, as I said, is one of my big takeaways um, as we move forward with these challenges. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Laura. That was a great presentation. And um, as many of you have been doing for Jesse, please uh, go ahead and put questions for Laura in the Q&A uh, chat box. Also, Laura, feel free to go in and answer some of those. And then we'll also have additional time at the end for further questions for the whole panel. Um, so, I just want to uh, now pass our, to our next speaker. David Gregg is Executive Director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey in Kingston, Rhode Island. And David is gonna talk to us today about grasping at straws, invasives management in Rhode Island, a state with no invasive statute. So uh, I will go ahead and mute myself. And David, just you are perfect. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Okay, uh, I'm David Gregg and I'm with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and I should start off by saying that the Natural History Survey is a membership nonprofit and we are not a state agency or a unit of the University of Rhode Island, even though we get our space from the University of Rhode Island. We're also non-regulatory and we're non-advocacy by policy uh, and we receive, well, $1,000 in state funds out of our whole budget, so um, not much. Um, and I also should say that Rhode Island technically has an invasive plant statute. Um, in 2012, uh, a law was passed to allow DEM to regulate aquatic invasive plants. However, the regulations for implementing this statute have never been um, finalized. They were uh, put out to public comment a year ago and they remain uh, unfinalized. So um, there is that. Uh, so what So what it has been the state of play for invasives in Rhode Island um, over the last 15 or 20 years? The, um, in about 2000, we, the Natural History Survey uh, uh, brought together the Rhode Island Invasive Species Council, and that included uh, the Coastal Zone Agency, Rhode Island DEM, a number of people at the University of Rhode Island, the Nature Conservancy, uh, as well as the nursery industry and the farm uh, and the farmers. And uh, the nursery industry in Rhode Island is um, quite significant economically, so it has a, a decent amount of clout politically as well. And the uh, director of the Natural History Survey at the time was Lisa Gould, and she chaired the Invasive Species Council while it created mission statement, um, operating principles, review criteria, and categories for invasiveness. And then it went ahead and created uh, a list using a, using a, um, a consensus uh, sort of method. And, and these are the categories that were that the invasive plants were assessed into and i'll run through them a little bit and you see if you can figure out what the pattern is here um, so widespread and invasive which everybody agreed there's a, these these plants and then restrictive and invasive were these plants and then it, this this is the sort of more information needs more research categories barberry burning bush shrub honeysuckle um, Trumpet creeper, autumn clematis, scotch broom, winter creeper, English oak, black locust, etc. So, um, of course, the what the pattern is is the uh, agreement on widespread and invasive included plants that weren't in the trade, and um, the things that needed more research were plants that were important economically for the nursery industry, and so. The consensus method, the sort of consensus method, um, voluntary list making was was important for raising public awareness, but it was not 
successful as an invasive uh, management strategy. So within in Rhode Island, with no state statute to guide policy, uh, there are a lot of organizations for which invasives are the third or fourth priority. Uh, they're definitely on the list. So the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel, and this is a sort of federal initiative, and it's um, chaired in Rhode Island by the Coastal Zone uh, Agency. And um, the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program, which is an EPA uh, initiative, and they have uh, primarily a focus on physical water quality, but they have involved uh, invasives as um, metrics for um, environmental um, uh, condition quality. Uh, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey is a federal initiative coming out of USDA APHIS, and it's very important in Rhode Island. It's probably the, the most active place where people concerned about invasives come together um, and can engage in communication. Uh, the Narragansett Bay National Australian Research Reserve uh, has a coastal training program that includes invasives, uh, habitat restoration, which often involve invasives. Again, this is a, this is a federal initiative. Uh, NRCS, of course, has uh, invasives built into a lot of the management plans coming out of there and a lot of the uh, restoration and management projects coming out of there. And the Environmental Monitoring Collaborative, which was a state initiative, and initially was focused on a monitoring a range of things uh, in Rhode Island, a range of metrics uh, for environmental quality in Rhode Island, one of which was invasives. And they tend, to, they, they tend recently to focus more on physical water quality rather than invasives. Now, other players would be the University of Rhode Island and the um, College of Environment and Life Sciences at URI has a number of programs that are really kind of the backbone of the public non-policy, non-statute um, uh, invasive response in Rhode Island, the Master Gardeners, um, the Biological Control Lab, which will say something about in a second. Um, URI is also the place where uh, vegetation management um, license, vegetation management certificates um, come from for uh, managing vegetation in the coastal zone. So they do the training for that. They also do the training for the pesticide applicators, which often include herbicides. Uh, and um, their uh, master gardeners um, and, and out, uh, extension and outreach are involved with um, other kinds of pest management in and outside of um, uh, managed uh, landscapes. URI is also the home for URI Watershed Watch, which is a, a community science project of, of nationwide um, stature. And they have, uh, with partners, created a aquatic plant uh, manual. And they've included, again, they're mostly focused on physical water quality, but they have included invasive plants in the list of things that they search for. So the URI Biocontrol Lab is um, involved with not just creating, not just um, bringing biocontrols into Rhode Island from other researchers, but also developing biocontrols uh, right here in Rhode Island, including for um, swallow warts. Um, they've, they've been um, the lead on that. Uh, and I, so now moving to the regulatory agencies, Rhode Island DEM uh, has um, invasives are sort of the third or fourth priority in three different divisions. Um, Office of Water Resources is probably the leader in this area, uh, particularly the, the lake associations in Rhode Island have a lot of clout and demand a lot of attention from this division. And so it's involved with mapping, surveying and mapping aquatic invasive plants. They do the boat ramp uh, program in the state and uh, they help to coordinate water chestnut management in a number of areas as well. The Division of Agriculture and Forestry um, recently combined, they used to be separate, um, but this is a, a, a division that's focused primarily on crops, which um, in Rhode Island isn't so much um, commodity crops as it is, um, do a lot with forest products, they do a lot with fruit, um, and uh, they do a lot with forest pests generally. Um, and uh, it's sort of, the, it's the, the home for the CAPS program, which I already said is really important for bringing people together in the state. 
and the Division of Fish and Wildlife. And here I just call attention to the um, Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan, which if you look at it, um, invasive, uh, invasives are the third most commonly cited threat for uh, species that are of uh, um, greatest conservation need after development and pollution. Uh, invasives are the second most commonly cited primary threat after development. And among secondary threats, invasives are twice as prevalent as the next highest. Again, I, I, I keep coming back to the idea that invasives, everybody thinks invasives are important, but they're everybody's third or fourth priority. And this really highlights that. A couple of other agencies, I, I did mention the um, Coastal Zone Management Agency, CRMC, which is sort of the home for the, um, the aquatic nuisance species stuff. That's a, focused mostly on fouling organisms and um, uh, marine and estuarine invertebrates, although we, they, we have in the past gotten some money from them to develop that aquatic plant manual that's used by Watershed Watch. And Rhode Island Department of Transportation has been very interested in invasives um, after their top priority, which is sort of bridge building and things that you do with bulldozers and concrete. Um, the standards manuals uh, talk about using the right kinds of plants and um, they uh, funded research on plant materials and maintenance regimes um, that promote native plants and discourage invasives. So what does this all add up to? Uh, Basically, there's a lot of capacity for education, especially education about not just the public, but about professionals involved in nursery and landscape industries or in um, maintenance of um, highways and things like that. Um, there's some uh, resources for prevention, such as um, boat ramps and um, Division of Agriculture and Forestry. They do quite a lot of surveillance for um, early detection uh, and, and they have some capacity for rapid response. Um, early detection is, is both agency-based and community-based. Uh, there's been quite a lot of um, work done on better choices for plant materials, um, both for uh, landscaping and for uh, habitat restoration. Um, some of you may be familiar with our Rhodey Native program, um, and that's sort of changed its format over the years, but there, it, it really moved the, dis the discussion forward on using the right plants and not the wrong plants from a voluntary position. Um, invasives are, are right there in management plans coming out of um, NRCS and, and other agencies. Uh, and I've been able to participate in regional networks like this and in interstate communication, um, such as the, the CAPS uh, program. So from the natural history, Survey's uh, point of view, we have continued with the Rhode Island Invasive Species Council. It meets once or twice a year. Uh, we have a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago, put out a new updated invasive and weedy list. And again, this is um, entirely voluntary. It has no um, statutory basis, uh, but it is very helpful for people who are trying to do the right thing on a, on a voluntary basis. Uh, and as I mentioned, the University of Rhode Island is um, really uh, the backbone for engaging the public on uh, vegetation management, pesticide uh, trainings, native alternatives, and um, access to taxonomic expertise and to biocontrols, bringing those into Rhode Island. Uh, so the Natural History Survey um, in our own programs has been focused primarily on empowerment. And one of the things that I would observe about um, having a statute in the state it tends to be the case when you have a statute that along with it come you know, legally binding uh, criteria and ass assessments, very high stake assessments, uh, and things become kind of, um, they come, become very complicated and disempowering of public engagement. And so we try to encourage people not to um, feel put off by technical aspects of invasive management. <clears throat> and um, we have uh, done a number of outreach things around what we call the easy eight, which you can identify plants you can identify without a PhD in botany and control without a PhD in chemistry. Um, and so um, we've been working primarily with land trusts and we've had some really good examples of land trusts that have kind of grabbed this uh, bull by the horns and done some really terrific work. Um, 
if you have the secondary sex, which can be, there can be issues with both IDs and um, control, but they're so uh, difficult to control once they're in a place that they're worth spending, um, giving extra attention to. Uh, and so the, in conclusion, uh, I would say, I would just remind everybody that these are the opinions of the director of a nonprofit. Um, these are not sort of state or state university um, uh, sanctioned observations. Um, the lack of an articulated policy or uh, articulated priorities, which you'd get in a, a state through, uh, through a statute and the regulation, regulations that implement it, does have a good side. And that is um, with the legal criteria and the rules, the consequences, um, there might be disempowerment and there might be disengagement. And we do have a lot of good public engagement now. Um, so that's good. But on the bad side, um, there's no budget within state agencies for uh, most of this invasive work. Um, there is um, uh, interstate and regional cooperation falls to nonprofits like the Natural History Survey. Uh, and we have limited ability to speak authoritatively on behalf of the state. Um, and of course, having no invasive, um, no teeth in invasive control in Rhode Island um, does uh, impair initiatives in our neighboring states in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Uh, but at last, the last thought I would say is <clears throat> Rhode Island's invasives um, management system, such as it is, it's not much of a system, a, but B, it's highly dependent on federal initiatives. And I think that that's the kind of where I would leave, where I would leave this is that the, the, the federal interest in invasive management is very important to the agencies and, pro, and programs ability to work with Rhode Island on invasives and provide us with whatever capacity we do have. So I'll conclude it there. Thank you so much, David. That was a great talk. So interesting to hear from Rhode Island. And um, as with the other speakers, please go ahead and put questions for David in the Q&A. Um, also speakers, I noticed that Laura did this. You are able to select that you'd like to answer it live. So if there's a question you think that would be relevant to others or that you'd like to answer live, you can label that and I'll read it off in our panel discussion. And also um, participants, if there's a question that you wanna ask to all the panelists, or a couple of the panelists, you're welcome to do that. And we'll be sure to read those off um, during our discussion in a few minutes here. But before we move into our discussion, we have our last speaker in the session. Um, that is Emily Pastorero. Um, she is the Program Direct Development Coordinator um, for the Invasive Species Center in Ontario, Canada. And also the Executive Director, uh, Sarah Rang, is also on the line so she can uh, support some of the question and answer session as well about the Institute. So um, Emily will be speaking about the Invasive Center's emerging work on climate change. So go ahead and take it away, Emily. All right, I'm just preparing this here. And there we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Carrie. Um, as, I, as she said, my name is Emily Posterero. I'm a program development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center. And I'm just going to give you a short talk about how we're connecting invasive species, our invasive species work with climate change. So just to give a brief introduction about um, who we are, uh, the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization we're actually based out of Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario, and we connect stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. And so to that end, our mission is to increase and diversify investment in invasive species management to catalyze action and, of course, to share knowledge. So, 
our um, increasing work in climate change uh, and connecting these two issues involves a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, of course, communications. Uh, you can see one of our fact sheets that we've produced uh, there. Um, we've been participating in the Ontario Provincial Climate Change Impact Assessment. And we've also been bringing forward this issue in, the, in our Invasive Species Municipal Community of Practice, which we facilitate. So I'm gonna be talking about those three things. Um, we're hoping to uh, link um, these issues between the US and Canada. I think that's super important. Um, we've been really happy to be sitting in on this panel, uh, mostly here to listen and learn. And we're definitely looking to make links with the Northeast RISCC management in the future. So to begin, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have developed a fact sheet on the links between the impacts of climate change and the impacts of invasive species. Um, so that's a freely available resource on our website, it's customizable for your own use. We're also hosting some upcoming events um, that are going to touch on this topic. So we do have our virtual annual invasive species forum that's actually coming up very soon, February 1st to 3rd. And there are going to be several talks on climate change and invasives within Canada. Um, in April, uh, we're actually hosting the International Conference on Aquatic Invasive Species taking place in Belgium, and there will be a session on climate change. Next, I'll tell you about the Ontario Provincial Climate Change Impact Assessment. So what the province of Ontario is doing is developing the first province-wide assessment of uh, the impact from climate change and the risk of that across multiple areas of focus. So they've delineated these areas as being people and communities, food and agriculture, infrastructure, business and the economy, and of course, the natural environment. So this process is meant to evaluate the impact of climate change uh, for the entire province, but also um, how that's differentiated uh, between each geographic region within the province as well. Basically what this is, is a virtual engagement process. So I've been involved um, by participating in virtual workshops and with written surveys as well. And it all gets reported back to the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, so basically what I do is I've been uh, participating as a representative of the ISC. And so I've been collaborating with my colleagues and then kind of bringing our feedback uh, back into the process. So um, what we've been really trying to get across through this process is that invasive species are generally underappreciated as a risk, um, despite them being the second greatest threat to biodiversity globally. Um, so it's really imperative that uh, we kind of bring that forward within this assessment. Um, I think it's, it's probably not new to anyone here, of course, that invasive species exacerbate the impacts of climate change and climate change is going to pave the way for species invasion. So our goal through this assessment has been to support the inclusion of the social, economic, and environmental impacts of invasive species into this assessment. So the ISC is just one of many organizations that were invited to provide feedback. Um, we've been highlighting the impact of invasive species on, of course, overall biodiversity and on ecosystem health and stability, uh, especially freshwater ecosystems and forests. Um, and then we've been trying to point out as well um, the specific impacts to uh, some of the different categories that have been outlined in this assessment. So, for example, the provisioning of fresh water resources and wood supplies obviously going to be impacted by invasive species. Uh, we know that carbon storage is um, really crucial for regulating climate, um, and that's going to be uh, impacted negatively by um, forest pests, for example. Even cultural services like uh, people fishing recreationally, that's going to be impacted by aquatic invasive plants and fish. Um, so we've been just trying to sort of bring these forward and make sure that invasive species are kept on the agenda over the course of this assessment. Next, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our invasive species municipal community of practice. Um, as I think we're probably well aware, municipalities are on the front lines of both managing invasive species and tackling climate change. Um, and so I consider this community of practice that I help to facilitate to be a really good avenue for, um, you know, bringing this issue to light a little bit and starting some discussions. Um, just for a bit of background, we've been facilitating this community of practice or COP as we call it uh, for some time. Basically what we're doing is just bringing together 
uh, professionals who work with invasive species in some capacity. They're from their uh, municipal staff members, conservation authority staff members. And we're just trying to bring this group together to foster discussion and exchange of expertise. Uh, we do this through our own COP website. We have a discussion forum on there that we use um, and also through two conference calls each year um, that we host with everyone. Um, and so through the COP, we've uh, started bringing forward, um, you know, the connection between climate change and invasive species. We know that's going to be uh, highly relevant to our membership. Um, and so we've, we've started bringing forward that discussion on the discussion forum and hope to, uh, you know, keep talking about that um, and just discussing solutions within the community of practice. Uh, moving forward, we are obviously anticipating uh, the increased spread of invasives into Canada with the progression of climate change. We do already have our eyes on the ground uh, with forest pests such as oak wilt, hemlock woolly adelgid, and spotted lanternfly. Um, and so to this end, we are definitely interested in learning more about RASBC and like I said, fostering those links between the US and Canada um, within this realm, it's gonna, that collaboration is gonna be super important. And we do always welcome new partnerships. Um, so all those resources that I've talked about in uh, my presentation, they are available on our website, which I encourage you to visit invasivespecies.ca. Um, you can also sign up for our quarterly newsletter that goes out called The Spread. We do send out a media and research scan on a bi-weekly basis. Um, and you'll also get uh, notifications about our upcoming events and webinars. And so that's it for me. Uh, thanks everyone so much for listening. Uh, my contact information is there if you ever need it. And um, as Carrie had mentioned, Sarah Rang is also in the audience um, if you wanted to tap her for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emily and all our speakers. I'd like to invite our panelists from the session to turn on your uh, videos again uh, so that we can open this up to uh, about a little under 15 minutes of discussion. Um, and while we're all coming back online, there was one question here and feel free uh, uh, participants to put more questions into the Q&A box that you think would be appropriate for, for the panel discussion. Um, and while we're getting started here, uh, Gary Fish put in a question for Laura and um, he says, it seems that the huge disturbance caused by uprooting bittersweet is more environmentally impactful than cut surface treatment with an herbicide. The potential for water contamination is minuscule with that form of treatment. Because it's much lower in risk, I wonder why you would continue to use, wouldn't continue to use herbicide treatment. Um, if there's no exposure, there's no risk. Um, and too bad we now have to please neighbors if there's no risk for them. And that potentially the uprooting and soil disturbance can cause so siltation in streams and create even more invasive plant problems. So it is an interesting challenge uh, as we are thinking about finding alternatives to herbicides. Um, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, that definitely was one of the first um, things that um, we were concerned about was just all that soil disturbance. And for example, what does it do to microorganisms and such? Um, and I'm not an expert in that either. Uh, but um, it's a pretty, so in terms of like the, the soil um, biota itself, you know, it, it's such a disturbed landscape. I'm not, I really don't know like how impactful it would be on that or not with the erosion and, and I welcome input from anyone. And then with the erosion factor, um, yeah, it was a concern. You're doing all this digging up, you know, are you going to create more growth of invasives because of the disturbance. Um, we really felt like, um, sorry, I was just reading that chat button. Uh, we really felt like this meticulous uprooting of the roots um, was actually getting a lot of the plant material. And I'd seen some success with this method at another site. Um, but we would still have to go back. And that's what this experiment is about. We're still going to go back every year and monitor and see if we're getting, um, uh, you know, pulling up little seedlings, 
We do have some native plants in there. We're gonna see how they do. We're trying to work around them and keep them intact. Um, and then in terms of the erosion itself, um, it's, a, it's not a very steep area. So you're not gonna have like a lot of washing away of soils. But, you know, again, we're just, and I'm going to be doing more observational because I'm not really a soil scientist. I wouldn't know what kind of, um, you know, studies to do on the soils themselves. So it's going to be more observational. Like, what do I see happening? Do I see washing out of soils? What plants are coming back or not coming back there? So, um, so yeah, it's a ton of soil disturbance. There's, it's kind of like, almost like you're plowing in a way in certain as you follow those roots. Um, but we'll see what happens and stay in tune because I will be keeping records at this property. But thanks for your question because it's very understandable concern. Great, thanks so much, Laura. And actually I have a question I wanted to throw out to any of the panelists who'd like to answer it. Um, how you all are working on different types of properties or at a state level, a province level, a national park or a smaller land trust property. And I'm just wondering um, how you've connected or when you're communicating about your work and when you're thinking about your work, how you've connected climate change to these invasive species issues. And if you have, how that's helped you garner support through funding or engage more people in the topic. Um, I know that we've talked a lot about climate and invasives, but I'm just curious about if that's been something you've articulated. And, and how that's helped you. Well, I, I would offer that um, in Rhode Island, it's perhaps the other, the causal arrow goes the other way. Um, most of the restoration um, projects in Rhode Island have a climate change aspect to them. They're either coastal or they're river or the river restorations. And, um, and so they're really about climate change and then they throw invasives in there because that's what they see and they want to make sure not to you know, make a, an opportunity for invasives in the process of a restoration. Thanks, David. Uh, Jesse, I saw you raised your hand. Yeah, I guess uh, I'd say it has a little bit for funding uh, and especially for getting uh, action with like we have a friends group, for example, Friends of Acadia. Um, so that that kind of communication piece does does help to to engage folks, but also kind of support kind of funding through that that partnership as as, as well for us. And I think a, a bigger part of it too that we're trying to do is kind of the stewardship communication with with certainly visitors to the to the parks. There's a, a lot of folks that are kind of coming through, and so kind of what kinds of um, what can folks do at home when they kind of what can they do kind of here at these sites, and then what can they you know kind of takeaways like planting natives versus invasives, but also just helping to inform and educate about what climate change is going to be doing all, all around, like in the park that, or space you might be in at that moment, but also you know in your own backyard and everywhere else, kind of trying to communicate that out. Great, thanks. And, and Sarah? Um, yeah, certainly uh, here in Ontario and in Canada, being able to link invasives to climate change has been important. Um, it is helpful in terms of uh, being connected to sort of a key governmental priority, a federal government priority. Um, and also it then allows you to access different kind of funding programs. But we're really at the beginning stage, I would say, of um, that discussion. A lot of the climate change discussion is focused on, you know, emission reductions and transportation and, you know, very important things. And so when you start to talk about invasives, um, you, it takes a lot of time to bring that issue to the table and build the, the background knowledge why there is a link and why that link needs to be considered. Um, much of the conversation is, is uh, rolling on different tracks. So it, it just takes a lot of time to build that link between the climate change and invasives um, with some of the sort of policy and uh, directions as well. So that's to date, that's been our experience. Great, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Emily? Yeah, I'm going to build on what Sarah said a little bit. Um, so just based on like my experience uh, helping to facilitate the community of practice, 
Um, I, I found it helpful to kind of uh, give like a very specific example of the issue um, that was like tailored to that audience. So, you know, I knew that cities and towns um, dealt with like a catastrophic loss of ash trees because of emerald ash borer. So uh, we kind of used that example with, um, you know, okay, emerald ash borer caused this uh, damage and, you know, that's going to reduce um, shade and uh, evapotranspiration in your city and town. So that reduces the natural cooling um, that, you know, is going to be so crucial uh, now and into the future as things heat up. Um, and especially if you're in like a bigger city and you have that urban heat island effect. So I tried to make that connection in less of an abstract way uh, with something specific that I knew um, you know, cities and towns would know about and we're dealing with. So yeah, with those communications, I think we're just trying to kind of uh, really tailor it to our audience. Hey, thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, it's really interesting that we share these, uh, how, we're do how we're spinning this and really engaging with the climate change uh, issues and bringing invasive species to the table. And I know, you know, in New York, we're also including invasive species in our climate assessment. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be a part of that process. But I know that in Ontario, I noticed you're also, you know, doing the same thing. So that is a, definitely a place to make sure uh, we raise awareness of, of invasives and climate change interactions. Um, there were a couple of questions that came up. So I'm going to kind of make them a little more generalized. Um, they were specifically for Laura, but I think anybody can step in. Um, you know, it looks like, you know, Laura's trying like a lot of really interesting non-herbicide alternatives and, you know, really doing a lot of background research on it. And the question was related to like, how are you documenting your success on that? Um, and how are you communicating it? And I think that that could also serve for, you know, some of Jesse's work or anyone else's work, um, David, and as well, that um, how are how are you um, documenting, you know, and communicating what you've done? So um, we are, we do have monitoring plots that we're using as well as uh, photo monitoring, um, in addition to just, you know, observational information that I find really helpful. In terms of how it gets communicated and recorded, we've actually been working with our um, small region cooperative invasive species management area and actually also the statewide MIPAG on coming up with a, um, a template for what information to keep and then share. Um, so that is located on the CISMA website as well. Um, it's, it's being tweaked a little bit, but it's mostly in place. Um, we have a project page on the CISMA website. Uh, so in terms of communicating that, um, the goal is to get those project case studies up on the website as each year as they're completed and as the projects move forward. And I know it's not going to be easy for any of us because it takes a lot of extra admin work, but that's our goal. And for, I should say, I put in the website for this particular project, the Smith Conservation Land, I typed it into. I guess it was a Q&A. So if you'd like, there's a lot of information on that page. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Jesse. So we're, we do uh, use pesticides as well as manual mechanical control. And I think I fully agree it's difficult to to monitor like treatment effectiveness and kind of success moving forward. We have some on smaller scale, we're doing that, for example, with the Asiatic bittersweet, kind of like in Laura's situation, it's near water. We did, it's drinking water source. We didn't want to use herbicide. We also didn't really want to dig it all up. So it's been a, it's been like a three to four year process of two to three cuttings each year. And it's like kind of still around, right? So it's, it's that long-term investment thing. So I think what, but what I do is I try to we document in our annual reports kind of the efforts we do in certain sites. And so eventually that could be that is a product that is available on National Park Service uh, overall website that does get kind of published out there. Nobody re reads it. But I, I think this is a this is a great point, though, is that how do we, even if it's like kind of small success stories and it might even just be a little bit of an aside, how can we communicate that out to folks that have 
a wide range of capacity to, to deal with those those things just so that it's, it may be a little bit of a, 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 a it might be just sort of like a like one little example but it could be something that people can use and, and move forward so i like that kind of clearinghouse example yeah that's a really great point and and we've got about uh less than a minute left but david um feel free to to respond to that as well i was just going to say that um in terrestrial cases in in um uh, these are invasive removal is often framed as a demonstration project and then there's a series of events where people come and walk and you invite other for instance it'd be in a land trust context you invite other stewardship chair committees to come and look at what you've done and get them interested and maybe break down some of the fear about what would happen if you tried to tackle your invasive so i think it's that's it takes that form here 